So in this video, I'm going to become a sniper in the trenches of World War One. This is a game called Verdun. The reason I'm playing it is because I watched the Sainsbury's advert last night, their Christmas advert. Since most of my audience are American, you probably don't know what Sainsbury's is. Because uh, I don't think they have stores in America, I think they're just a British supermarket. But basically, at Christmas, supermarkets have like a advert competition where they try to make the coolest advert. And the one that Sainsbury's did this year was on the Christmas truce in World War One, which is where soldiers from Britain and Germany came out of their trenches and met on Christmas Day in no man's land to to celebrate Christmas. And, and they didn't shoot each other, they sort of became friends for the day. Got to put on my gas mask, because they're hitting us with mustard gas. But the idea behind this game, it's it's on early access at Steam at the moment, so there's not a, a, a ton of content in it. Um, but you basically have to protect your trenches as sort of unit, you're all split up into squads of four, and then on the whistle, you've got to go over the top, rush across the miles of freaking no man land it feels like when people are shooting at you, and then get into the enemy's trenches, clear them out, hold the trench, and if you manage to hold it for long enough and they don't get a foothold back, you can push onto the next set of trenches. So that's hopefully what I'm going to be able to do in this video. If you're wondering where this game gets its name from, by the way, Verdun, it's actually spelled Verdun. I'm pretty sure the, the French do pronounce it Verdun, though. Um, so if you're looking on the Steam store, in fact, I'll probably put a link in the description, then uh, it is actually spelled Verdun. Um, but basically, it was probably the longest, in fact, it was the longest battle in World War I. Uh, it went on from, like, February 1916 all the way through to the end of the war. World War I, of course, finished on November the 11th. So it was incredibly long and it basically sort of led into and caused the well-known Battle of the Somme. So the Germans figured that they would just absolutely obliterate a small area of the trench line which was a, had become a bit of a stalemate at the start of 1916 near the town of Verdun because there were a couple of forts there which were of historical sentiment to the French and I think the Germans thought if they just wiped out the French in that area then the French would lose so much morale from losing these forts that they basically just give up on the war. Unfortunately, the Germans didn't figure on the French putting up some pretty stiff resistance after the initial attack, because the initial attack was one hell of a surprise for the French. The Germans fired, in, the, in just this initial push, 2.5 million shells. It, just, it was literally like a three-mile or four-mile stretch of trenches near Verdun at this fort. Now, if you've ever seen the pictures, in fact, I'll put a picture up now. This was before, and this was after. There was like literally every meter of the ground in that area had pretty much got hit by a shell. Even worse for the French, they only had 56 elderly, and I'm talking like dad's army style soldiers, holding the fort. So when these the, these poor guys saw this massive like armada of German troops just push over no man's land, they just let them in because there was absolutely no point in resisting it. The French though, when they realized, really did not like this and they did one of the largest pushes back to take this fort and one of the most costly pushes that happened other than perhaps the Battle of the Somme in World War One. In the first two months of this fight at Verdun 120,000 Germans died and 133,000 French. It was... it was... there was a general who was responsible in France for that area of the trench line called General Patin and this was his quote about what he saw. When they came out of the battle what a pitiful sight they were. Their expressions seemed frozen by a wisdom of terror. They sagged beneath the weight of horrifying memories. And the thing is as well, you've got to remember at this time, if you've ever seen Clive Owen's The Nick TV show, which is about surgery and medical care in the 1900s, a small wound could pretty much kill you given how dirty and stuff the trenches were. Because antibiotics weren't discovered until 1928. This of course was 1916 by Alexander Fleming. So. I mean, pretty much any small thing could... I mean, admittedly, in the Nick, they were still using cocaine as the main pain... Cocaine! As the main painkiller uh, back in the 1900s. They'd actually spit, switched to uh, chloroform and Novocaine, I think, instead, by World War One. But still, if you got an infection, you could be pretty much screwed. How does all this relate to the Christmas truce, though? Well, it doesn't, really. Except the Christmas truce took place in 1914, right at the start of the war, where most soldiers hadn't really been into any sort of fighting because when people hear about the Christmas truce they can't sort of believe a lot of people that you'd actually get out of your trenches 
just one day to go and fraternize with the guys who were trying to kill you every other day of the year and will be trying to kill you the next day as well. But you see, in 1914, compared to, like, the Battle of Verdun in 1916, there was kind of this, like, live and let live thing going on in the trenches because most soldiers hadn't actually been in any serious fighting. Because believe it or not, a lot of the trench line was actually quite peaceful in World War I. And this is an actual statistic. Nine out of ten British Tommies who went to fight in the trenches survived World War I. This is because soldiers got rotated really often. Like the trenches are sort of split up into different lines of defense. So at the front, you've got like a really complicated zigzag firing line, which is what all this gameplay takes place in. And that's in a complicated zigzag so that if a shell happens to land directly in the trench, it doesn't just like funnel along it and just kill everybody in it. It's just sort of focused to that one little area of the trench. And then behind the firing line trenches, about 200 meters back, largely out of the area where the Germans would be shooting. You've got the support trenches, just in case the front line got, got taken over. And then behind that, you've got the reserve trenches, which was basically completely out of the way where soldiers could rest. It was a lot nicer back there. And then you've got all the medical stuff and out of the trenches to the support camps right at the back of that. The average squad would only spend five days a month actually within sort of shooting range of the Germans. And they weren't actually a lot of the time, if it was a peaceful area of the front, trying to kill the Germans. Because the routine was basically, they got up about 4am and they did this thing called morning hate. Which is where they sort of fired over at the German trenches. And a lot of the time they just sort of fired over the top of it to sort of suppress the enemy a little bit. Then they had breakfast, did some weapon cleaning. And throughout most of the day they just sort of did general chores, perhaps digging a bit further in the trenches. Until 730 where they did another sort of stand to, where they shot over at the Germans as well, to sort of intimidate them so the Germans didn't run across no man's land in the dark. And then from 9pm onwards was probably the most dangerous time, because they actually had to go and grab any casualties or, or set up defences and stuff in no man's land, where under the cover of darkness. You see, well, this is why in 1914 they could be friends together on Christmas Day, play football together and, and get haircuts and the rest from each other, because... Each side was treating each other as human at that point. By the time the Germans had started using chlorine and mustard gas on the Allies to try and kill everybody in the trenches as they did later on, they were of course seen more as the enemy. So by 1915, unfortunately, Christmas truces were pretty rare to happen. And believe it or not, this is an interesting fact. Adolf Hitler was in the trenches as a second corporal in the German army at the time the Christmas truce took place and he was opposed to it happening, so I'd imagine he probably sat in his trench instead of coming out over no man's land. Which to me is a little bit surprising honestly, because just three months before the Christmas truce in October 1914, a British soldier called Henry Tandy didn't shoot an injured unarmed Hitler when the British were taking back a town the Germans were defending. So Hitler was defending this town, he basically got wounded, lost his weapon, he was walking across the road, Henry Tandy saw he's there, could have raised his rifle and just shot him dead if he wanted to, but he let Hitler pass. And another interesting thing is Hitler had in his Alpine resort a massive portrait painting of Henry Tandy because he saw him in a British newspaper and was so thankful to this British soldier for saving his life. To sort of sum up life in the trenches then, as a soldier, whether you survived or not, seemed to be largely down to look whether or not at the time you were on the front line that one of the officers gave an order to go over the top or there was a big battle going on like the sum and some people were unlucky this is a, a note a very famous note by a British soldier called Percy Boswell who was on the front line he was given an order for the next day to go over the top during the Battle of the Somme and charge across no man's land and this is what he wrote to his mother the night before I'm just writing you a short note you'll receive only if anything happened to me the next few days. I'm absolutely certain I shall get through all right, but in case the unexpected does happen, I shall rest content with the knowledge that I've done my duty and one cannot do more. Goodbye, with the best of love to all. The next day, Percy Boswell was found dead in no man's land. What passing bells for those who die is cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle. That's a, uh, that's a poem called Anthem for the Doomed Youth by uh, Wilfred Owen. That is probably one of the most somber notes I've ever ended a video on. 
so I won't. I'll end it on something a bit happier. So my last video, somebody suggested that it would be a good idea to donate some money to charity, as I'm doing YouTube as a hobby really. So since a lot of people here obviously play and buy video games, I've set up a G2A.com referral link, which basically gets you Steam and Origin keys for about 10% cheaper, I think, on average. They're a huge company, totally legitimate. You'll have seen their banners and stuff all over the place. And literally the only time Steam's gonna be cheaper is when the Steam sales on. But if you buy games by the referral link in the description, then 2%, I think, of the price of that game will basically go towards its charity donation. I don't know how much that'll make, but uh, I'll make up the difference to $1,000 a month. It'll make significantly more than that, obviously. I'll increase that amount. But I'm going to do that for the next 12 months. If you want to suggest a charity in the description, then by all means do so. Uh, I can donate to a different charity this month, depending on which one people want. And I'll post up the donation receipt on my Facebook page. So, yeah. If you want to do that, it's there for you. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, guys. And I'll see you in the next chapter.